So, okay, so our uh, second speaker of the day is uh, Hans Dierks uh, from Leuven in, in University in Belgium. And so the title of his talk is uh, a geometric approach to the dynamics of cardiac excitation patterns. Okay, can you hear me well? Very good. Okay, good. I will start. And first of all, uh, Benjamin, thank you for inviting me for this lecture series. I will talk about applied maths and more uh, in, in particular about geometry and uh, cardiac excitation patterns. And I understand that a lot of people in the audience are covering different topics within uh, biological dynamics, such as neuroscience. And I will therefore give this talk as a quite uh, broad uh, perspective. So I will give examples and messages which are quite general and then apply them on a cardiology example. Let's get started. You will probably recognize here uh, a stimulation protocol and a train of action potentials, but it's not, it's the outline of my talk because this is my protocol for trying to excite you as an audience. <laughs> First, I will do in an initiation protocols, send some waves of knowledge to the audience about how the heart works. And then there are five distinct parts, which are separate messages or topics. Then I put a conclusion, which comes very short after the uh, fifth message. And then, you know, chaos can set in in the heart and that will be the <laughs> Q&A session, which I hope will uh, not go into a chaotic state in the end. So let's get started with the initiation, and that's the biophysics of cardiac arrhythmias. So you can see on the uh, animation here that the heart is um, pumping in a, a regular manner. And how does it pump? Well, there is an electrical signal that originates from the left atrium, which is the uh, natural pacemaker of the heart. Then this signal is spread through uh, the muscle cells. It comes in the middle to the uh, atrioventricular node, then through the convection system, and then spreads through the heart. But the important part where it can go wrong is that this conduction system only covers a small portion of the heart muscle. And then in the other part of the heart, um, the signal is transmitted by the muscle cells themselves, and therefore it can go wrong. For example, if they can get stuck, they can get stuck in something like a Mexican wave, which goes around the heart, and then you have an arrhythmia. Uh, the signal that triggers the mechanical contraction is electrical uh, depolarization, which I will describe in more detail. And therefore, um, you can think of the wave propagating through the heart as a collection of dipoles, of electrical dipoles. If you then measure potentials on the body surface, this is called the electrocardiogram. If you measure these potentials close to the heart, for example, during surgery, uh, this is called an intracardiac uh, electrogram. And we will be talking about these uh, electrograms in a minute. Uh, then also we want to uh, present mathematical modeling. Uh, and there's nothing new in this. This is um, a set of ODEs which you can put up for um, um, a cardiac cell. Uh, a simple uh, real realization would, would be the Fitzhugh-Nagumo system or even uh, Hodgkin-Huxley equations borrowed from neuroscience. Uh, at the early days, this was all in excitable uh, media. And thereafter, there are, have been designed um, tens of different functions f of u, which are called cardiac models. And if you then integrate uh, this thing numerically or using uh, semi-analytical means in the old days without uh, uh, powerful computers, then you can uh, compute or uh, calculate in steps uh, action potentials uh, which come out of the system. So this state variable u, I will use it uh, repeatedly, um, it contains different variables. The most important is here shown on the top uh, right. The first one is the transmembrane potential because a lot of uh, processes in the membrane uh, depend on uh, the transmembrane voltage. And then the opening and closed states of the um, ion channels in the cell membrane, as well as the concentrations within the cell and outside the cell are given here by this W. Then this uh, change, rate of change of U depends in general of all the uh, variables and therefore we have this f of u but you can think of it as like a first uh, f which determines how the voltage changes and then k determines how the other variables change and if you integrate this uh, with the computer you get the action potential here shown in red 
Uh, it looks a bit different uh, the, uh, from the previous presentation because in, uh, in the heart, the muscle cells, they have a plateau phase and also they are followed by mechanical contraction here given by the blue curve. The number of state variables depends on the model. So the simplest models with activation and recovery have only two variables uh, and the more, more difficult ones can have uh, tens of variables. But this does not yet represent a cell, a, a heart, it re represents a part of the cell. So the question is, how will we uh, couple this spatially? And in the 1970s, a model was derived for this, uh, that's the bi-domain model, and we require it for computing electrograms and uh, electrocardiograms. In this model, um, you need to distinguish between the, uh, the intracellular extra uh, intracellular potential and the extracellular potential. So phi int and phi x, as shown here on the slide, are, are two different potentials. Hence, we call it a bi-domain, referring to these two, vol these two voltages. They have their own diffusivity or conductivity uh, for the spreading of um, the potentials in the medium. These are dN and dX, and the difference between both is Vn. Um, the model in its full glory is uh, shown here. So the first equation basically describes conservation of current. The second equation uh, describes the rate of change of the transmembrane potential. It was the first equation from the previous, previous slides, uh, slide. And then uh, all other equations are local equations and they, they are shown here. What can we tell about it regarding solving the equations? Well, the first one is an elliptic partial differential equation. It's expensive to solve in a computer. But if you need to uh, compute uh, electrograms or electrocardiograms, you uh, accurately you have to solve it. Then the second one is a parabolic PDE that can be solved by time stepping. And this is a set of ODEs for local variables that you can integrate in uh, update in every time step. Because this model is so um, expensive uh, to um, do forward stepping, um, there is a um, simplification, which is called the monodomain model. So yeah. if you assume that the intracellular domain and the extracellular domain, uh, th that these tensors are scalar multiples of each other, you can um, reformulate the whole thing and get back to this uh, DTU uh, equal F of U, DTU equals F of U, plus an anisotropic diffusion term D. And this anisotropic diffusion, uh, it has a catch because the heart is a muscle. Uh, the uh, fiber direction is not constant, but it has an intricate uh, rotation of, the, of these myofibers. So that uh, is a challenge both from the analytical side and from the numerical side uh, to handle. And these, um, this anisotropy makes that if you have the waves that go through the heart, that they uh, propagate at double speed around uh, along the fibers compared to the transverse directions. If you then bring um, all these together and you put these equations in a computer, you can get uh, models of excitation and you can start looking at the emerging patterns. So here we see uh, three rows. The top row shows what doctors will see. They will typically look at an ECG. Uh, then in simulations, this is what models will see. This is kind of uh, the idealized situation. And then on the bottom, we have uh, samples uh, collected in Leiden uh, by the Pineapples Lab, where they show in a Petri dish with uh, cultivated heart cells that there is also this uh, traveling waves or spiral waves or multiple of these spirals. And then in general, uh, we think we know that the uh, normal heart rhythm corresponds to a plane wave which moves through the heart in a standard way and therefore it contracts coherently. In tachycardia, uh, you have one or maybe uh, at least few of these uh, rotors or of these spiral waves. And in fibrillation, it's still uh, not completely understood. It's an open question if that is chaotic or not. But you have these uh, wandering uh, wavelets and many interactions. And of course, as a mathematical dynamical systems person, we want to know how do we get or why do we get from left to right and ideally how can you make a heart that's on the right go back to the normal state. So that was the introduction. Let's come to the first message. Um, my message would be here, analytical solutions in the age of machine learning and simulations are still valuable. Um, I dare to say that because this week we published a paper with an analytical solution, and I'm, I'm happy to share this with you.
So which problem did we tackle? Um, doctors during surgery, they, uh, they often measure uh, the local potentials, electrical potentials inside the heart in the blood pool. And they see certain waveforms and from these waveforms and shapes, they want to derive all kinds of information like how is the wave traveling from which depth is there a focus and so on. And so together with my uh, student, uh, Laura Leenknecht, we made a three layer geometry here. I should point at the screen. Um, so there is the torso, there is a cardiac wall and there is a blood pool with an electrode. Uh, we take a slab geometry, but the top and bottom layer are um, extending to infinity. And uh, the problem at hand is that there are different conductivities because there is a conductivity, electrical con conductivity from the blood in the torso. And then because the cardiac wall is isotrop anisotropic it ha and has conductivities for the intra and extracellular domains, uh, it has four conductivities. The conductivities are related to the diffusion tensor that I uh, told you before. Uh, in this way, um, you just have to uh, divide by the membrane capac capacitance. So the question is, if you have a wave profile going from left to right uh, as a, a kink wave or an excitation wave, can you find uh, the analytical um, solution? And the answer is yes. And in fact, you can use fairly standard um, electromagnetics uh, because the first um, bi-domain equation can be written in this form. Um, you can recognize here that it's a Poisson problem. Basically, you have the anisotropic Laplacian of the potential equals, equals a charge density. And this charge density is related to uh, another Laplacian applied to the transmembrane voltage. If you then substitute uh, a step function for this uh, uh, right-hand side, you have a problem that you can uh, try to solve. And for that, you need a Green's function in the wall. And for a three-layered geometry, you can do this using the method of mirrors. Uh, you have different kinds of reflections. So in the end, you get a summation over all mirror sources. Um, and that's what is shown here. So this is the end result. Uh, to us, it looks elegant uh, because it replaces infin infinitely many simulations. Uh, we can learn things from it. For example, we can see what is a prefactor. Uh, we can see that it's related to angles that you can measure in the tissue. And also here, there's an eta. And it's something that comes out from the calculation. You need to rescale the thickness according to something related to the uh, conductivities. Um, does this work? Uh, well, it works quite good for this simple geometry. For example, if you have the one electrode um, <clears throat> a potential for a wave passing here in black is the finite element solution of the, of the problem. We only treated the wave uh, initiation, so this part. And you can see uh, that it nicely fits uh, with the orange curve. If you cut the solution to one term, then you see that even uh, the first uh, leading term gives a reasonable approximation. And this also holds if you measure it with two electrodes parallel to the tissue, or if you measure perpendicular to the tissue. Um, so of course, for complex geometries, the story will be different. Uh, but still, we now better understand how uh, effects such as tissue thickness and conductivities um, and uh, local fiber direction um, determine the amplitude and the shape of these potentials. Uh, sorry, Hans, there's a question in the in the audience. Um, okay. So, yeah, the, the domain, the domain that it's what you showed in the previous slide or what's? Yes. That's the domain. Okay. That's right. the domain, but the domain, the, it's invariant in the y direction. So we make a simplification that's a 2D domain and that mm. uh, the torso is infinitely large and the blood pool as well. So it works if you measure very close to the inside of the heart. Of course, the heart is a sphere, but I guess you can, I mean, in first approximation, it's also possible to, to include the curvature, but that is basically the geometry. So, but, so it's, you, you assume it's infinite or? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right, all right. So, okay. If okay, you're looking from the standpoint of the electrode within the heart, and if you're close to the heart wall, then the infinity is, is not that bad because the, the, the potentials also decay. So, if it's um, it basically ceased or gets the most of the activation from uh, of the intensity of the signal from the first centimeters around the uh, around the electrode, of course. All right. Thank you. I think that answers the question. Thank you. This also concluded my first uh, topic. 
The second uh, message I want to bring is the following. Uh, biology exhibits many long linear structures, so you cannot in general use linear superposition, but you can try to find the slow drift of these structures using perturbation theory and uh, linear superposition. I will give an example to highlight this. Um, it's about wave fronts. So we know that uh, wave fronts in the heart are propagating and they in fact have many characteristics in common with a bushfire because there is also a wave front. It's a reaction diffusion front. And if two of these uh, waves meet, they will extinguish or annihilate each other. Therefore, you cannot, as in electromagnetism or in shallow water waves, just impose, uh, superimpose two of these colliding waves and you should do something different. But actually, the fact that this wave always tries to take the same shape and action, action potential always tries to take the same velocity and the same amplitude and the same duration, this is actually a strength for uh, one mathematical uh, method, which is uh, gradient expansion. So what we did, if you have a wave front propagating, uh, here on the screen to the, to the right or the right and a bit forward, you can see or think of this uh, solution that is thought as a collection of one-dimensional waves that is traveling and there's a bundle of these wave, waves traveling together. Uh, if you, uh, the trick is, of course, how to put this idea into mathematics, and then we can say we take the uh, exact solution u as a function of x and t to be a traveling wave solution, sometime, something that depends on the coordinates from the wave front uh, minus vt, so that's u of r minus vt, and capital U is the, the standard wave front that, that propagates. And plus corrections, these corrections can be due to anything, due to uh, heterogeneity of the medium, due to the curvature of this uh, front, and so on. If you write this down mathematically, you need a special kind of coordinates. These are Gauss normal coordinates. So basically, you, you need to take two coordinates, sigma 1 and sigma 2, within the wave front. Uh, rho is the distance from the wave front. And then with these three coordinates, you do a coordinate transformation. You apply this coordinate transformation to the Laplacian, and you can uh, try to um, do further steps. In this process, uh, you will also need perturbation theory. And uh, the main idea is that a wave front only reacts to stimuli just ahead of it. So for example, if you have a bushfire, and if you uh, um, light a match after um, the bushfire has passed, nothing, not much will happen. If you have a small stimulus like one kilometer ahead of the bushfire, probably nothing will happen. But if you start doing things just when the front is approaching, then you can impact on the front's propagation speed. Also, if you do small things to the medium, for example, increase the temperature a bit for this uh, bushfire or to, to do something with, uh, with electrodes or illumination in the heart, the wave front will shift in space or time because you can make it go faster or go slower. And we can write this in the following form. If you add a perturbation term, epsilon with epsilon small times h, uh, which is a perturbation, then you can find that uh, the solution is given by this traveling wave solution plus a correction. And the main effect will not be this correction, but the fact that your traveling wave solution is advancing faster or slowing than in the normal case. And this advancement can be written as a linear superposition of some sensitivity function times um, the perturbation that you apply. And in this way, if you do this, for example, for a curved wave front, you can actually compute what will happen to a curved wave front, as I will um, proceed to show. This function w here is called a localized sensitivity function. It's also known as a response function or as an adjoint critical eigenmode. But for people in neuroscience, they will know it as the phase response curve. So if you look at the wave front, um, not as a wave front, as a function of uh, space, but as a, a spike, as a function of time, you more or less have the same kind of theory. As a result, uh, we applied this to the Laplacian. So if you have a, a wave front that is curved, then it's possible to express this uh, um, derivative uh, Laplacian as um, the second order spatial derivative in the direction of wave propagation plus other terms, which are the corrections, which will be this h from the previous slide. If you then do the math, you find that the velocity of the front equals the velocity of the um, 
the plane wave and corrections. And these corrections are related to the curvature of the front. So the first one is minus gamma H and H is then the sum of inverse radii of the front locally. Uh, so in brief, it explains this phenomenon. Uh, so you can, in an intuitive way, reason that if a front is uh, convex, that uh, points here will easily excite the, point, the points just before it. Um, and therefore, the velocity will be bigger. For the planar case is the reference case. And if it, the front has the opposite curvature, the wave speed will reduce. But the way in, this, in which this is reduced can be quantified using this gamma, using this theory, and also these response functions. But I will not go into details uh, about it. You can do something similar for spiral waves. Uh, you've seen these spiral waves in the movie. They are associated to tachycardia. If you look at such a spiral wave, <coughs> Then we see that it's, uh, it fills the entire space. If you make the medium larger, then it also fills the entire space. And therefore, they also fill the heart. Um, but from the previous, in the previous example, we saw that uh, you can track the advancing of such a wavefront by predicting how the speed is changing due to a perturbation. Which kind of speed can the spiral have? It can have three different speeds. It can shift in the X direction, it can shift in the Y direction, and it can start also rotating faster or slower. So therefore we have three broken symmetries, we would call it in physics, uh, X, Y, and the angle. And as a result, we have three response functions. These are graphs of these response functions. So these are the kernels that you need to uh, multiply a perturbation width to see the effect of the spiral. And the most important property is that these things are localized. It's still not proven, but we find it in almost every numerical example. Uh, and it means that if you want to move the spiral or accelerate its rotation, you need to deliver a small stimulus very close to the core. And this is important for therapy uh, because we know if you want to stop the uh, arrhythmia, uh, the only way which we know is defibrillation. And defibrillation uses very strong electrical shocks because if you would apply a very small current, you are in this regime, and it's practically impossible to apply this small current to uh, get to this, uh, to this uh, rotor core. Therefore, the only solution that is there now is to um, reset the whole medium uh, and hope that the normal rhythm will start again. But this is not always successful. It has some problems uh, because it burns uh, the outside of the heart and so on. So still, there is an ongoing, uh, of course, open challenge. Um, to find better ways for defibrillation. If you go to three dimensions, then you can imagine that if you have these rotating waves that they rotate around the curve, as you can see here on the right, and this curve, this, uh, curve is called the filament. Um, using the same kind of approach, using the response functions, uh, it was shown in 94 by Diktashev et al, uh, that this um, filament also has uh, motion which depends on the uh, curvature of the filament. So K is a curvature, so it's one over the uh, radius of curvature. If the filament is straight, then also it will not move anymore. But an interesting happen thing happens when you have a filament which is curved, because a curved filament, according to this uh, evolution equation, will move towards the normal and also move towards the binormal. And you can already see that if it moves to the normal direction, and this gamma one is positive, then it will become a bit more straight. <clears throat> and this is a very important uh, observation because it, because it gives rise to an important bifurcation. Uh, the total filament length also in the same paper was shown to evolve as uh, according to the following formula. So the total rate of change is minus this filament tension times uh, the integral of the curvature squared, which is positive. So it means that um, if gamma one is positive, then the filament length will always decrease in time. So if, if you have a very wiggly filament, it will in the end straighten up. If you have a small loop, it will uh, shrink to size zero and disappear. Conversely, if gamma one is negative, then you go in the other direction and I can show you here the process. Uh, so this arrow, the top arrow shows what happens if you have a negative filament tension. If you have a filament which is originally almost straight, it will become more and more irregular and also produce multiple filaments. 
and it's still a high hypothesis that this is something that can happen in uh, people who undergo um, sudden cardiac death or sudden fibrillation without early signs. So if something happens to their heart, um, they create one such vortex or one such rotor uh, uh, curling around this line. And if you then in your heart for some reason have negative tension, then this will soon multiply and give rise to a fibrillation. So the question is also still open question, is this mechanism true? And can you find uh, drugs, for example, which work on the filament tension, such that if something happens to your heart, you first go to the more benign uh, um, tachycardia. It will change, uh, uh, last a bit, a few minutes more because the heart is still contracting, but it's still also a state that needs to be stopped. That was my second part. Um, the third part, <clears throat> Here is a message. There are some powerful geometric principles in biology. Um, and it will bring us to far away places. So the question is how to deal with local anisotropy. I explained that in this uh, reaction diffusion term with uh, anisotropic diffusion, uh, there is this uh, D tensor. And because the heart has a very uh, complex uh, fiber structure, the question is how to deal with it. And until 2003, the only thing to, to do was to put it in numerical simulations and then see what happens. And then there was an interesting uh, remark uh, by several researchers, uh, but with the first publication uh, by uh, Wellner et al. And they know about um, the Laplacian on a spherical surface or the Laplacian in a curved space in, in general. And there it is known that uh, a Laplacian should be written in this way using the square root of g, and then you also here have g, i, j, and so on. And this g is a metric. It determines how uh, space locally looks like. And then there was the remark, well, if we disregard or assume that this g, which is the determinant of the matrix, is constant, then both things are equivalent. And this was uh, a conjecture. And it said the heart is a curved space, or in more posh language, a Riemannian manifold. If you put um, the metric tensor of this curved space equal to the inverse of the diffusion tensor. The inverse is encoded because if you take a look at this gij, if the ij is on the top, it implies a metric inversion. So in um, more uh, simple language. If you want to measure a distance, as you would measure distances in polar coordinates or so on, uh, you don't have uh, the Pythagorean law anymore, but you need to include this gij. And um, many of us know it from like the, the courses in physics or mathematical physics. Relativity theory is all about working with these gij tensors and finding the consequences. So part of our previous re uh, research was about applying these concepts to the heart using covariant derivatives and geodesics and the like. So the first result, which was uh, found here, was a uh, Wellner's conjecture. And at the time, he did uh, numerical simulations. And he found that filaments, if you let them evolve uh, long enough, uh, they take an equilibrium shape. And if you add fibers to the medium, it's not straight. But it turned out to be a geodesic of this space if you take this g equals to the inverse of d. At the time, he could not prove it. Uh, a few years later, um, I started my PhD and I worked with uh, Professor Henri Verschelde in Ghent, and we were able to um, use this analogy to perform actual calculations. And for example, the, um, the wave front motion uh, with this gamma that I showed before, we also found it how to do it in anisotropy. And in anisotropy, you basically also uh, need to replace the ordinary derivatives by a covariant curve space derivative, and thereby you find uh, that the law is basically conserved, the same as in the isotropic case. But if you want to predict how the wave behaves in the anisotropic case, uh, you need to do this re replacement. Similarly, we found the equation for filament motion. So remember the one gamma 1 kn plus gamma 2 uh, kb. Uh, and if you write it in curved space notation, it looks like this. And that's interesting because you can now think uh, when does the uh, filament does not change its position anymore. And this happens if this term equals zero, because then automatically also this term will be zero. And that term is exactly the geodesic equation. So it means that we had a proof of Fellner's conjecture at the time. And we know that filaments are static only if they are geodesic. Uh, the fun part about this paper, 
I still want to show, I think it's my best graph in a publication up to now, because to derive this equation, we used Fermi coordinates and Fermi in the 1920s derived a coordinate system for uh, inter, a relativistic spaceship, which would travel at great speed. It looks a bit like this. We still haven't uh, seen this spaceship after 100 years, but we still we have used the coordinate system to describe the filaments in the heart. So that was a geometric principle. Um, we are already at uh, action potential four, and that is about also maybe a quite a general question or message. Um, in the past years, I learned that you should break free from old concepts if they don't work. And that old concept um, is basically the two previous parts of my presentation. So it also works against me. I know that. Um, but <clears throat> we, in, in our field for about 30 years, um, we've always thought in terms of phase singularities. So what happens if you have an excitable system? It could be also an oscillatory system or a neuroscience system. If you look at the local dynamics, you find um, that if you put them against uh, activation and a recovery um, axis, that they form a, a closed loop. If you then color a spiral according to this phase, according to this angle, you find that in some points in the center of the spiral, um, it seems that all the colors come together. More uh, precisely, if you take a closed contour around the center, you make a change of two pi. And it was concluded in this famous paper that there must be a phase singularity in between uh, in it. Uh, so a point where all the phases meet. And this is a thing, this last step that we will question here. Now, why do we question this? There are some issues related to the classical phase singularity mapping. For example, on the top row, you can see that uh, a wave has passed to the right. There is initiation of a new wave. That new wave curls around a conduction block because this tissue has had, had not recovered. And if you then start tracking the phase singularities in white, there are many, many of these phase singularities. You can get rid of it of them by filtering, uh, but we don't think that this filtering is a good idea um, <clears throat> because if you look at it, there is not a single point where two, all the colors meet. There is like a whole streak or line where you have on both sides different colors. We see the same in this kind of simulations. If you look at the local activation times here on the right, you can see that the, um, <clears throat> the contour lines seem to meet each other. And we also see, uh, saw similar things in experiments. So the question was, what is going on here? And that's a conduction block line. So here you can see it from an initial condition. If um, you let the wavefront advance here in dark blue, then it follows its own tail, we would say, and then it, it turns uh, down and then in the end it becomes a, a spiral wave and it moves back along the uh, a line that basically is the border between the previously excited and the newly recovered uh, region. So across this conduction block line, you can see it here in, in uh, black, there is two different phases, but we know from mathematics that if a phase is discontinuous across a line, it also has a name. It is not a phase singularity, it's a branch cut. It's things that people use in complex analysis or in uh, theoretical physics. So we concluded that there should be a phase defect line <coughs> for a mathematical branch cut. We were not the only ones to remark this because in the same year, there's also another group by Tommy et al that uh, published similar graphs in this context. But in summary, we can see that in simple models of cardiac excitation, indeed, there is such a single point. But if you have the more detailed models and more accurate models, you can see that there is a, a, a mathematical branch cut. And you can see the difference if you plot it in three dimensions, then the old theory would say that there is a staircase surface for the, um, for the face. And in the other view that we promote, we see that in some cases, it's more like a parking lot, right? That you move up to the next floor, then you're a bit flat, and then you move, move up to the next floor. And this is a distinction uh, that we could also find uh, in experiment that will be on the next slide. Uh, but if you look to, in general, the interpretation of what, in our opinion, doctors should do, currently doctors are looking for phase singularities, and at these points, they tend to, or they want, or they try to 
uh, burn away the tissue. So what are they studying? If a wave front hits a wave back, then two phase singularities are formed. And in our view, we would say there is a phase defect line, PDL phase defect line that is being formed. If you look at a single rotor, there's a wave front and a wave back in the classical theory joined by a phase singularity, we would say that they both end on an extended line. <clears throat> so if you want to operate with this, either mathematically or in practice or in experiment, it makes a difference because the picture is different. In the current theory, you are looking for isolated points like you would see in Monument Valley, and you want to find these point needles in the haystack. And we say, well, it's actually, they are needles. It's more like a cliff landscape uh, that is in the heart. So there are regions with different phase and they are intersected uh, by cliffs. Um, and we think, or at least we have to do a lot of homework to also generalize uh, the filament and the geometric theory and so on, but we think that it can solve some of the existing open questions in the field. Uh, we also detected these things uh, experimentally. This is uh, the voltage in a rabbit heart from our collaborator Elena Tolkacheva. Uh, and here in black, you can see this uh, conduction block lines. So there is a progression from the left to the right. There is a wave front here circling around it. And in the end, it will also hit another region and become a conduction block itself. And also, if you look at the phase singularities, they kind of, here you have two on this line, and there is one, um, there is one and two again. So they jump back and forth. And they have a very short lifetime. But uh, if you look at the persisting pattern, the persisting pattern is that at all times, there is this uh, mathematical uh, branch cut, which is still there. Okay. Now the fourth, uh, the fifth part is the last part. Um, I'm actually glad that there is a lot of people of neuroscience in the um, in the audience because somehow we are here looking for overarching ideas because we see that we in our world we see these spiral waves and so on, but they are working in a in a continuum in the myocardium, and we know that other complex systems like neural tissue are more graph-like. And the question is, can we do something with this concept of a, a spiral wave and filament also in, in more graph context? And the first step in that direction is, get, is taken here. So the first uh, remark is that a lot of uh, systems are uh, using this reaction diffusion uh, modeling because basically there is something locally going on. For example, uh, growing of color or uh, uh, inflammation of an artery or shearing or excitation or infection. And they are also coupled together using some kind of diffusion, either in a continuous or in a discrete way. And so we asked ourselves the question, what if we do this reaction diffusion, uh, but in n-dimensional space, uh, in more than three dimensions? And then the question is, why should you do it? Well, we know that in two dimensions, for example, if you put everything on a grid, then every point that is excitable has, has four neighbors. In 3D, it will have six neighbors. And so in n dimensions, each node has uh, two n neighbors. So basically, if we would do this in R10, it would correspond to a system where every excitable element has 20 neighbors. Still, a major limitation is that it is, at least in the theory that we have now, um, that it is for this Rn network. So it's an n dimensional grid. It's very densely uh, connected. It's also very regular, uh, but we hope to extend it in the future. So if you write the, the reaction diffusion here, then it becomes this. So the rate of change of U is a sum over currents, which go over the edges of the graph. And um, they go to the neighbors, which are given here by this adjacency matrix. And then there is also the nonlinear phenomenon. And uh, our, uh, at the time, our master thesis student Marie ran some, ran some simulations. And we find, in fact, that we see these spiral waves in uh, four dimensions. But then there is a, a little uh, thing to keep in mind because you have a rotation of a spiral wave. This rotation takes place in two dimensions. If you are working in four dimensions, then you still have two dimensions left. So the rotation axis is not an axis, it's a plane. And these rotation planes, you can see them here depicted also here. And depending on which 
dimension you leave out in this overview because we cannot depict um, four dimensions at the same time. We, uh, we see or we have an impression of what is going in, on in this uh, scroll wave. Uh, we can go further because also we tried something since this filament will be a plane in which in the four dimensions something can rotate around. You can create this uh, filament with a hole in it and then we have to also see interesting dynamics because the hole shrinks over time and in the end the thing becomes a bit more planar. Then there's also the question, can we explain this? Yes, we can explain this using theory um, because we uh, call these filaments super filaments because they are more than one dimensional and we have all the machinery from ordinary filaments. Therefore, um, we were able to find the equations of motion. This one on the left was the one for regular filaments. For super filament, it looks a bit the same, <clears throat> but the H is uh, something different. H is a kind of combination between the curvature of a front times the normal vector and also the curvature of a filament times the filament normal. And this works in any dimension um, for a filament that is, has two dimensions less than the medium. Then the second term says you should rotate this over 90 degrees to get the second term. There was also the evolution of the length. This evolution of the length also works for su super filaments because there we can see in any number of dimensions that the area or hyper area or hyper volume will uh, decrease uh, over time according to uh, uh, this uh, integrand, uh, which is also always positive. So we also see that if the filament tension exists and if it's positive that this uh, super filament will try to minimize its area and then the end solution instead of a geodesic we find a minimal surface and we also found it in the simulation. So more details are given in the in the archive preprint which is over there and <clears throat> we think that I mean it could be interesting also to see uh, because it does not occur in the heart but maybe in other complex systems which are connected to more than six neighbors uh, uh, in general that maybe some traces of this uh, this uh, interesting dynamics could, can be found. So it's time for my conclusion. Um, with cardiac excitation as an example, I try to give uh, some uh, general ideas that I think are important in biodynamics. Uh, the first one was about analytical solutions. If you find them, they don't, can st still be valuable. Also, there are nonlinear structure, but using this response function theory, you can see how they evolve. Uh, there are geometric principles uh, which can save the day because they may hold for any kind of uh, local reaction. Um, if you have an old concept, uh, don't stick too long to it. If it doesn't work for you, maybe you need to, to broaden the concept. And also, um, I think in general, as a community, we should be open to spot overarching ideas and to, to see if uh, what we can learn from it. Um, so I also... Uh, it remains to thank uh, for me my uh, collaborators, Verschelde, uh, Panfilov, Piktashev, and Van der Veken, uh, the experimental people I work with, and also my team here in Kortrijk, uh, Louise Loor, Desmond, Nathan, and Marie, uh, who are a, a fantastic team to work with. Uh, thank you all for listening, and I'm happy to, uh, to answer any questions in the remaining time.